Whenever you want, when we can. Erev good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to uh, start by thanking Arachim and the Discovery Organization for making this evening's possible. I don't know about you guys, but I get a kick out of them. I really like uh, being with you guys. Yeah, you challenge me, and I enjoy it. For those who are new, and I do see new faces in the crowd, my name is Paz. And um, what we do here is kind of like a group coaching session. So it's not a lecture. Please do not keep your questions for the end. The moment you agree with something, let me know. If you disagree with something, let me know. And if you didn't understand something I said, definitely let me know. We're starting a series of three meetings, right? We, we got three meetings. And they're going to rotate all around decision-making. There is a like, lack of guidance when it comes to how to make decisions. People go to all kinds of means to try to make decisions. Anything from counselors to advisors to gurus to superstitions to make-believe to whatever they can get their hands on to try to guide them <coughs> through the web of decision-making. And in your ages, university students, these decisions are starting to become serious because you're making lifelong decisions. You, whatever you guys, whatever paths you guys choose now are going to impact the way your lives are going to look. So how do we make decisions? What's the root of decisions? What does the Torah have to teach us about religions? That's uh, about decisions. That's what we're here to discuss tonight. Now, we're not exactly focusing on any specific type, because once we learn how to make it, we're good with anything, be it coffee or tea, be it which partner to pick for life, be it uh, selecting a career. Believe it or not, they're all pretty much the same. If we know how to make one, we know how to make all. Tonight's session will break concepts. It will change the way we look at ideas. It will change the way we look at what decision making is because our language distorts our minds. Anybody read the book 1984? Yeah. Okay. So you guys know that by controlling language, we can control thought. And that's what happened to us. Our language got distorted, and our concepts got distorted with it. So let's line things up. There is a philosophical idea. I don't know if it was ever actually, the experiment was actually ever carried out, but philosophically, <coughs> it definitely works. What happens if you take a donkey, a hungry donkey, you put him in the middle of the desert, and you put two identical buckets with an identical amount of food, an identical food in each, in identical distance away from him in different directions. Anybody knows, at least philosophically, what's, what's going to happen to this donkey? Nothing. He dies. He's going to? Starve. He's going to die of starvation. Why? I'm sorry? Can't decide which one to go to. Well, what difference does it make? Just pick one. It's better than starving, right? Who cares? <clears throat> so why does he starve? He lacks that thinking part of the brain. He acts solely upon instinct. instinct. Animals lack thought. Yes? really understand why. Like, okay, so if instinct, instinct wins, he will run for food. He will not care first one and then the other one. Since there isn't a preference to which one to run, his instincts are stuck. <coughs> An instinct is something that does not put thought into it. He cannot say, well, it's better than dying, so I might as well just pick one. It doesn't matter which one. Is this a real experiment? 
I'm sorry? Is this a real experiment? <laughs> As I said, I don't know if the experiment was carried out, but philosophically and for those who understand animals, it's obvious that that's what happens. There isn't really a discussion whether this is how animals work. What we want to understand is why do they work this way. We, there isn't a discussion whether the donkey is going to starve or not. He's going to starve. The question is what's lacking in him that we have? Why would we not starve and he would? Yeah, I know, but now you're going from, a, from like it's like a hypothesis, but you're, you're, you're saying it's, it's true, but you don't even know if this is true. The hypothesis, the hypothesis is not that animals act on instinct. That is a known. It's a scientific fact. Animals act on instinct. They lack uh, the ability to consider. Even what we interpret as consideration, for them is instinct. They lack the whole department in the brain, the cognitive thinking brain. They just, it's missing. Okay. They don't have it. So there isn't, it's not a, 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 an assumption that they cannot think. It's fact they don't have okay. what it requires to think. It's kind of like, you know, Snakes do not walk, they lack legs. Say that? Yeah. Now, the question is, why is it so obvious for us that we're not going to starve and a donkey starves? Because we can think forward. Okay? We can run it in our heads, go, okay, I'm here, I have a dilemma, I don't know whether I go here and I go there, but I have a third problem. I'm starving. So there's bucket number one, bucket number two, and there's starvation. For him, it ends with only two options, bucket number one and bucket number two. That's another limitation that animals have. Animals think in binary form. Okay? You will notice very often that people who are not deep thinkers think in binary form. Okay? You tell them, why did you do this? They say, well, what's better if I would have done that? So what happened to option number three, four, five, and six? See, they never bothered going through them. They had one option, they had the second one. It looks less bad than the first, and they went for it. They never, third of a third, never thought of a third, fourth, and fifth option. See there? So we're different than animals. We both have a cognitive mind and an imagination. So we're able to weigh additional options than the ones evident to us. We don't have to think in binary form. That's what makes it so difficult for computers to think like human beings. They need artificial intelligence. They don't have intelligence because computers are binary creatures. The only things in yeses and nos, zeros and ones, do's and don'ts, you know, like him, like him not, like him. Say that? <laughs> they, don't, they, they don't have a third option. We do. Now, when we go to Starbucks, right, and decide to pay, I don't know, what is it now, $5 for a cup of coffee? <laughs> Whatever it may be these days. And they ask us, what is it you want? Which coffee do you choose? <clears throat> That's when they start confusing us. You see, we don't really choose coffee, we pick coffee. What's the difference? The difference is when I make a choice, a choice between vanilla and chocolate, I'm using the same department in my head as the donkey uses picking a bucket of food. Dance. That's right. It's a need versus a need. Or a want versus a want. That's exactly what the donkey is doing as well. When we pick a shirt or a pair of pants, what do we weigh? <coughs> we weigh how much we like it, right? It has to fit us and be within our budget, but when it comes down to it, between 
it and the one next to it, how do we make that decision the same way the animal makes the decision? The same way it picks one tree to build its nest on versus another. Okay? Basic instinct. The interesting thing is that we're a lot worse at it than animals are. You will not get an animal circling the field 20 times until they pick a cucumber to eat. Right? Okay? Now if you go shopping, <laughs> you better wear your comfortable shoes. Okay? Now, um, some people actually make a sport out of it, right? <laughs> they make a day out of it. Why is it that it's so difficult for us to make simple decisions? By the way, you guys are identifying with what I'm talking about, making simple decisions, yet at, time, at the time of the decision, it looks so difficult to make. And the worst thing is, we go home and then we go, no, I should have taken the other one. I definitely should have taken the other one. Okay, and then we're too lazy to take it and exchange it. Nahon, who can identify with that pattern? Too many people. Okay. <laughs> Why do we have that? What's so difficult? What difference does it make? What happened to that shirt I debated and thought about and went back and forth about four years ago? It's gone, it's in the garbage. Right? Anybody still has his shirts from five years ago? Good for you. <laughs> My children should learn from you. Okay? <laughs> um, so, but... But we don't keep all of our clothes from five years ago, right? No, they go to the garbage, okay? So this is something that we're buying today knowing it's going to go to the garbage. Why is it so difficult for us to pick it? Because we're mixing departments. We don't know the difference between picking and choosing. You see, when we're in a restaurant, it's only the animal element within us that's working. But it's difficult for a human being to admit he's an animal. It's difficult. What? You mean this complex decision I'm making right now between grilled cheese and, you know, marinara sauce on, on spaghetti is, is no more than a donkey selecting whether to eat a cucumber or a tomato? The answer is yes. And your mistake would be to involve your cognitive mind within the decision. Okay? There is no such thing as the right shirt. There is the more pleasant one. Pleasant is a feeling. Wear this one, wear that one. And if they feel the same, they are the same. Flip a coin and take one home. Right? Don't stand there like the donkey over there starving for a shirt. Uh -huh. If they feel exactly the same, you're in the donkey dilemma. Okay, lucky for you, you have a coin in your pocket. Donkeys don't. If they had one, they wouldn't starve. Say there, flip a coin, take a shirt, go home. Why? Because it's only your basic animalistic instinct that's making that decision. You should, waiters go nuts with customers. I'm telling you, I spoke to waiters, and they go crazy. They're like, you know, you give them the menus, you go away, you give them time, and it's not like it's the first time here, and it's not like they haven't seen the menu, and it hasn't changed. You ask them, are you ready? And they say, no. no. And then you say, fine, please continue taking up a table and not paying anything. Okay, and you give them some more time. And then you come back and you say, are you ready now? And they say, yes, I'm ready. And they say, what would you like? And they go, mmm. Mmm. <laughs> okay? And then they start mixing and matching. Can I get this, but with that sandwich and with the other sauce? And please make sure I don't get any oil on my french fries. Okay? What's the deal? Come on. This food is going to turn into... Something unpleasant in 
two to six hours. Who cares? No one's going to remember. <laughs> Just eat it. Get it over with. Move on with life. You know, my wife, would, my life would have been so much better if I would have ordered a thousand islands rather than ranch. Who cares? Right? Is it going to have any impact on your life? The answer is no. But, I mean, if you're going to eat only things that is pleasurable for you, like fries, I don't know, if you're going to continue eating fries every time you go out because it's pleasurable for you in the moment, then it has an effect later on in life, like you're going to get fat, right? Absolutely. When we make a decision, an actual choice, we don't pick between one and the other, but when we make a choice for life, which we will discuss in a minute, we don't make it at the moment's notice. We don't make it in real time. In real time, we don't make choices. We pick things. Okay? So if you decided, I'm not going to eat deep fried things, when you go in, you don't get to pick between deep fried things. Okay? But you're still going to have to pick between one thing and another. Okay? Come time to pick. Just pick one. Why? Because it's the most basic element within a human being that's making this decision now. What element is it? The animal element. By the way, I, I, I skipped over a part that said that human beings are built of three different elements, right? There's the basic physical animal within us. There's the nefesh, which is our thinking minds. And there is our souls. I just, under the assumption that you guys heard enough of that, I continued forward. Everybody knows what I'm talking about? What are the Hebrew terms for it? Nefesh behemit, nefesh adam. Nefesh behemit is also called a goof. Nefesh adam, also called dat. <coughs> and Neshama. Is Ruach also a part of it? A Ruach is, is a, a kinui, either for a level of the Neshama or the overall spirit within a person. Okay, our language. And what's the Neshama? The it's just a soul. Good old simple, it's, it's what's left of us after everything dies and turns into warm food. Say there? Okay. So now, we're human beings. We would like to take ourselves forward to the level of making actual choices. Choices are not between a preference and a preference. Choices are not between a need and a need. Choices are between a need, a need and an ideal values. When a value and a need <coughs> contradict, only then do you get to make a real choice. I'll give you an example and you'll see why animals cannot make choices. They only get to pick. I'm really, really, really hungry. Starving. Okay? But the food that's available to me is not mine. Now, I have the ideology, I have value of not stealing. I have a need for food. <clears throat> when I'm hungry and the only thing that's available to me is somebody else's food, I now get to really make a choice. This is when we choose. This is when the animal element and the brain are in conflict. That's the definition of a choice. Animals don't get to choose. Because animals do not have a set of values. Is that there? So we do not practice our human abilities when we order coffee. 
Free choice does not come into expression there at all. Unfortunately, we find that the common person spends more than 90% of his daily decisions not choosing at all, only picking. You pick a route to work. Right? We pick our lunch. We pick our clothes. Whether we say good morning to a friend in the morning, that's a choice. Whether we allow somebody to take our parking spot without getting mad at him and spend five more minutes looking for another parking spot for ourselves, that's a choice. Say that? Because there is a contradiction, there's a conflict between our need and our value system. I need to get to work fast. I need to get out of this hot, uncomfortable car. My value system tells me to be kind to others, to help others in their time of need, to be forgiving. That's when I'm measured as a human being. The more decision, decisions that veer towards our mind, the more humans we are. The more we let our instincts win the argument, the more we give in to our needs, the more we strengthen the animal element within us. Which, by the way, which one of them do we want to strengthen? The human cognitive value system. Okay? Now, so far so good, because you guys are super quiet. Not that I'm not loving it, yeah? <laughs> I get to put a lot of material out there this way. But, yeah. Um, I don't know how to ask this. But so, if you have to take a really important decision in your life, like sometimes you want to think about it for a while. <laughs> so, you're saying it's better to just like put yourself in the like conflict immediately like between the need and the ideal and take the decision instead of like waiting and analyzing and give it time no 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 i totally no 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 it because you say like in order to take a decision you if need you're to picking conflict. between two preferences <coughs> okay between vanilla and chocolate between coffee or tea mm -hmm. just go in there make a decision come out once we're looking at a choice between a value and a necessity and a need, we need to wait very carefully. Okay. Okay? okay? Now, remember when we said we try not to think binary? We try to think outside the box. We try to create third, fourth, and fifth options. We always try for an option which will both satisfy our basic needs and will go according to our value system. Okay? So I would like to satisfy my need for food and make sure that it's both kosher and it's fully paid for and so on and so forth. So we look for a solution that fills, fills all of our needs. Can I ask something? Oh, yes. Would you regard studying as a value or a need? Let's find out. When you study, what do you get out of it? What does it give you? What do you have after you study that you didn't have before you study? Knowledge. 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 Very good. Is knowledge um, anything that suits your body? Does it, is it tangible? Is it something you can take, sell, give? Will you, chas shalom, become ill or lack if you don't have any? No. I mean, you can you can sell it if you if you, yeah. you want to have like shirts or something. You can share it. Share it. So, so what is it then? Value. 
value. Very good. Knowledge is a value. You can choose to have some. You can choose not to have any. And need is not something you can choose not to have at all. You can choose to delay. You can choose to postpone. But you cannot choose not to have. Okay? Which is basically, by the way, sidetracking, just giving a thing. That's the downfall of Eastern and Western philosophies. They both took needs and try to cancel them off. If it's a need, you cannot cancel it off. All you get to do is direct it to the correct place. Okay? So when you have a need and you try to deprive yourself from that need, then you get child molesters. Okay? So what happens to people who don't get married? Right? They told, hey, if you want to be great and holy, <coughs> deprive yourself of a very basic human need. You cannot. Kadosh Baruch Hu does not tell you to deprive yourself of anything. He tells you, direct your needs to the proper places. Okay? And as a matter of fact, when a couple gets married, right under the chuppah, this is one of the things we say. One of the blessings says, He forbade us to just take women off the street and permitted us, our wives, by way of kiddushin. Okay? So we don't deprive ourselves of anything. Adraba. I don't think Jews look deprived. <laughs> I look around and believe me, they live good. We just have to focus it. And that's what Judaism is about. It's not about not doing things. It's about doing it right. Say there? So we are here to learn how to make decisions. First thing we need to know is what is a decision. Most of us look at what we pick as a choice. And that's where the mistake starts. Yes? So you're saying like to not waste your time on picking because it's but like but what's wrong with like if if I'm picking You're also strengthening the animalistic element within you. You're giving it validity when it doesn't really have one. Because actually there is no meaning to that pick. There is no difference. If there is a value involved, then it's not a pick, it's a choice. And if there's no value involved, then it has no meaning. The moment we spend time and energy within it, we give it validity. We strengthen a part that's not serving us. It's going against what we want to be. We want to be a more finite human being. We cannot be a finite human being living in a mall. Okay? By the way, all, the whole advertising industry is built around... Anybody studying advertising? Communications. Communications. Oh, there you go. What is advertising founded upon? What's the foundation of advertising? Human need. Human need. Take the animalistic, basic instincts and need within you. Trigger them. Associate them with the product. And convince the idiot watching the ad that by buying this, he will fulfill this and that basic emotional need. Right? I will have a much better marriage if I'll buy a Porsche. <laughs> okay? I will have very well educated kids if I'll buy them this cereal. But it's also about values. Like, they try to get your values and then they want to sell you the product according to what you think is good for you, for example, or what you think is good for your child. If you have, like, 
if you want biological food for your child and this kind of value for your for for you then for your family or something then you buy this product also that's right again basically fooling you mm. okay <laughs> which is when I when I was studying it and I realized how it works <coughs> first thing I did was try to reduce the amount of exposure that I have to advertising. I don't need them implanting false ideas in my mind. Nahon? I mean, everybody within advertising knows that. Right? So here's the secret is out. It's going to be on YouTube too. Okay? <laughs> so, throw that junk out. It's making our lives difficult. Because later on, we're going to have to make real choices. And you know what's going to make it difficult for us to use our cognitive mind to make real choices? What we believe we really need or want. And it's going to be so big, it's going to come in contradiction with what we should be doing. Okay? What does a smart person do? What he wants or what he should do? Wow, this is very huh? A smart person? If a smart person can get to do both together, excellent. If you don't get to do both, which should you do? The right thing to do. A smart person would consider them to be the same. I'm sorry? I said a smart person would consider them to be the same. They're not. What he wants and what he should? Yeah. A smart person would consider it to be the same. What he should do is what he should want to do. Ah, he should make it so it's the same for him. Very good. Okay, we were just, we just took a leap forward, okay? We're talking here about bringing our wants to be in sync with the right thing to do. In other words, if I really, really, really want a cheeseburger, okay? But I know it's not the right thing to do. It would either be ideal for me to want the hamburger or the burger. Or next thing is to do what? Manipulate my mind not to want it. Manipulate my mind not to want it. Is it possible yes. for us to manipulate ourselves into wanting or not wanting things? Very good. Is it as good as our natural needs and wants? No. Also very good because it makes the next part of our lecture very interesting. But first things first, let's summarize before we jump forward because I want to make sure we're all on the same page because this is, this is going to get complicated real fast. So, so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page before we go forward. There is a difference between picking and choosing, right? Ah, yes. oh, yeah, I forgot to say, I'm locked that door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a difference between picking and choosing. When we pick, we pick between one need and another need. Coffee and tea. When we choose, we choose between a need and a value, right? An idea, idea or a concept or something I believe in versus something I want or need. Say that? I heard a very interesting uh, way to define the difference between a want and a need. A need is something I want but am embarrassed to ask for. Yes? What, can it ever be like a value versus a value? It always boils down to a need versus value, and I'll explain. Academic knowledge versus spiritual knowledge, right? Why not both? Because we lack time or money. Boils down to need versus a value. Have both. You can't. You can't. Why? What, what are your restrictions? 
time or money. Time and money are are not values. Oh, they're needs. Yeah, but you need it for two, for the, to uh, have the value in your life. You need, you need them. When you still, you have limited resources and you, need, you can either invest it in... Ah, which one has, which, so, okay, so you're saying like this. I already have limited resources. I can only study one. Yes. Which one should I study? Okay. So in other words, what takes precedence what takes priority within my value system? Excellent question. Our value system is what we're supposed to be spending time building. Okay? We spend, by the way, uh, anywhere from 16 to 18 years of education. Never do anything for our value system. Okay? And guess where most of... Why what? Because they don't teach values in university. You don't spend 18 years in university. No, we spend 12 in high normal school, in high, high school. school. Okay. They don't not teach values. In That's right. You're right. They do a lot worse. They teach crooked values. <laughs> I prefer they wouldn't teach values at all. I think it highly depends on the time you're studying. I agree. In the rare places they do teach proper values, they usually do a decent job. In most places, they either, in good case, they don't teach values, and in bad cases, they teach the wrong values, often opposite of what it should be. We learn greed, we learn competition, we learn that the means justify that the ends justify the means, okay? We learn uh, that if somebody else <coughs> progresses, then we will stay behind. Yeah, we learn, yeah? If anybody studied law, Shem Yerachem Aleichem. Okay? Really, the wrong values. Okay? So what we are here to do is first step, the basic level, is to learn to make our decisions with our minds, with the value system and not the need. A higher level of that is to prioritize our values. Know which goes first, which goes second. Okay? What comes first and what comes next? Is there an absolute way, is there a scientific way to build a value system? No. Yeah. Oh. Wait, wait, we're dividing into two uh, uh, <laughs> schools of thought here. Anyone says yes? Is there a way, a scientific way, to build a value system? Okay, but um, <coughs> even when the Torah does give us a, a value system, it doesn't give it to us based on scientific values. Nahon? So values, any angle or way you look at it, it's got nothing to do with science. Which is where our modernization fails. We've progressed wonderfully with science. Science is doing things for us that are magnificent. It's distracting us within lectures, with text messages and emails. It's annoying us morning, day, and night, letting people we don't want to reach us, reach us. Okay? It's curing diseases. It's curing diseases. <laughs> it's making us more comfortable shoes. Right? We, we get plastic bottles and, uh, and all kinds of good technology. Technology is doing wonderful things here. People are going to be able to watch this all over the world. That's technology. But as a human being, what have I progressed thanks to science? The answer is zero. Because I am a human being by means of my 
cognitive mind by my value system. Otherwise, I'm back to the animal picking between the two different buckets. My value system progressed nothing thanks to science. Where then do I gain my value system from? That's a point of thought. We'll come back to it. Let's continue a little more forward. There is two types of decisions that we make on a daily basis, again, confusing the language, and that is between what's good for me and what's pleasant for me. Okay? People often confuse good and pleasant. Is it pleasant to go to the dentist? No. Is it good for you? Not for your pocket, but it's quite good for you, right? It's good for your health. It's good for your smile. But it's definitely far from being pleasant. Is ice cream good for you? No. Is it pleasant? Yeah. <laughs> especially in Israel heat, right? So there is a difference between what's pleasant for me and what's good for me. When I'm facing a conflict between pleasant and good, what should I do? Good. First things first, we study that we break out of the binary system and we say, if I can get both, why not, right? That's what they do. They try to convince you that, you know, they make you bubble gum that's going to brush your teeth and it's going to be healthy for your gums and, you know, yada yada, going to make you smarter and prettier. Okay? So now you feel that it's not only tasty, it's pleasant. It's not only pleasant, but it's also good for you. So if we can get a choice that's both, we take that. Right? Think outside the box. If we didn't manage to make... But something that is good for you will just be in the future, so it kind of goes together. It's, you mean pleasant for the moment? Yes. And there are also certain things that are not pleasant also in the future either. Bubblegum is not a good for the future. <laughs> okay? I mean... Yeah, but I'm saying if it is good for you. If it's, then if it's, it's good for pleasant. you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to become pleasant. There are certain things that are good for you, they're never going to be pleasant. You know what I mean? <clears throat> we had to put our dog to sleep. It never got pleasant. <laughs> okay? Years later, still not pleasant. <laughs> okay? But it's something we had to do. It was the right thing to do, not pleasant to do, but we needed to do it. Okay? That thing was costing way too much money. Had to be to see. Okay? <laughs> okay? It's, it's also a nice way to, um, it, it, you can also use it to much easier, more easily educate your kids. So you see what happened to the dog? Don't mess with me. Okay? <laughs> okay, we get rid of him, we can get rid of you. <laughs> it's all a matter of money. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, yeah. I, by the way, after the decision making, we're going to give a course in children's education. Yes. But those decisions are easy. They are both between a need and a value. Okay, but what about deciding between two values or two needs? That's oh, what you're oh, very, very good. Very good. So now that we have established our foundation, we can dive into it. Anybody has the time? Everybody knows where are we holding as far? Because it says 3 o'clock over there. As far as I'm concerned, I've got time. We have 10 minutes left? No, we have 20 minutes left. Ah, upset there. We have 20 minutes left. We're good. Okay. How then do we decide between two different values? Before we ask ourselves, by the way, when we decide between two different picks, we said that two different picks, two different ones, have no meaning flip a coin and take one. So that one we resolved. How do we decide, what do we do when we have a value and a need and a want? What did we decide? If we can get both, wonderful. If we cannot get both, what do you do? Value. value. So that we resolved as well. 
we're only left with what to do between one value and another. Say that? So we're done with the set now, and the next two meetings we can just party. No, I'm just <laughs> we have plenty more, Baruch Hashem. But what do we do between two different values? I already opened the door on that one when I asked how do we even build our value system? We want to be able to, we're already jumping forward to how do we prioritize them, right? How do we know which, which value overrides which one? How do we even decide on values? Does a woman have the right over her body so she can have an abortion if she doesn't want the baby? Or does the baby have the right to live? Or fetus, if we want to be technically correct. Okay? Value versus value. Nahon? Do you have the right to smoke? Or do I have the right not to breathe smoky air? Which one of us has a right to this spot on the street? Value versus value. We, th we concluded, pretty much unanimously, that science cannot make values. No, you also agreed, right? Scientifically, we can prove the Torah, but science cannot decide for us whether it's the mother's right or the fetus's right, right? The smoker's right or the non-smoker's right. So if science cannot do it, whom can build or decide on values for us? Any suggestions? Parents. Shem Yerachem Aleinu with our parents' value system. <laughs> <laughs> No offense, parents. <laughs> uh, well, you didn't agree with your parents' value systems either, so we're fair. <laughs> right? Did our parents adopt their parents' value system? No. Then I'm doing what my parents are doing. You see, I'm a good boy. I do what my parents do. <coughs> they didn't adopt their parents' value system. I'm not adopting theirs. How then... It's also value. What? I'm not adapting my parents' system. No, that's just being stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? So, how can I then build a real value system? Who's there to judge what's right and what's wrong, what's better, what's worse, what's greater, and what's simple? Excellent question, right? I'm open for philosophical, general, historical ideas. I'm open for anything, do your homework, think about it, come back next week. We're not done yet, don't worry. That's not the only homework assignment you guys are going to get. Think about it, weigh it, come back and tell me how can I decide on a value system both for myself and in general as a family, as a neighborhood, as a society, as a community, as a nation, because if it's not only enough that I decide on a value system for myself, if I decided that one's right to listen to music does not override the other's right to sleep, it's not enough that I decide on that value system, who else has to agree with me? The next to you. My neighbor. The one with the new stereo system. Okay? Or the one who wants to sleep. Or the one who wants to sleep. Say that? So it's not enough that I built myself a value system. Okay? Using bazooka jokes and eight ball advices. Magic eight ball advices. But I also have to have something that others accept and agree to. Otherwise, I have to go live on a deserted island. Say that? So this is just food for thought. And here comes, yeah. Sorry, I have a question from before. You said that between two needs, there is no such a problem. But because you compared need of eating with need of eating, but you didn't compare between need of eating with need of sleeping. 
נכון. I don't have a problem because needs we have a natural need volume indicator built into us. Okay? We don't have a problem. Our instincts will tell us what do we need more. So there isn't a course in finding out what you need more because you're going to feel it. And if it's something that you don't feel but you need to decide because you know that it's the right thing to do, then it's again value versus... Now I have a question. Where's that accent from? <laughs> ah, very <laughs> nice. Okay. Tada? So we're back to the value system. How do I decide which values are good for me? Come on. I cannot go based on my neighbor's values. I cannot go based on the government's values. God save us. I cannot go based on the values in the school of philosophy because the final conclusion is as long as you're happy, do whatever you want. Okay? Here, I just saved you guys three years of philosophy. Huh? Depending on the philosophy. Okay. We'll debate it, but yeah, I, I had a lot of time to debate it. it. It all ended up being pretty much there. You know, is if you're happy, that's the whole concept of consenting adults. What is consenting adults? Makes you happy, do it. You know what I mean? As long as you don't hurt anyone else, have fun. We don't care. Close the door, don't let us see what you're doing. Uh-huh. So, so it, it pretty much breaks down to this. So we want to be able to make real life decisions. When we go to set, pick a career, what do we pick it on? Which elements come in? Is it a picking a career or choosing a career? Which we do? Which do we do? We choose. It's needs, plural, versus values, plural. Okay, now our needs are very simple. What do I need? I need to work as little as possible. I need a lot of money. And I need respect and appreciation. Anything else we need from our workplace? Positive environment, supportive environment. Beautiful. But these are the... the <laughs> <laughs> Staples. Um, <laughs> any other office supplies we can steal? <laughs> Horrible. Remind me not to hire any of you guys. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, you see why when I had my own office, I used to tell people, bring your own equipment from home? This is the result. Okay. The, the idea is that a lot, of these, a lot of the things we want are just side effects. I mean, if we feel appreciated and we like, if we feel appreciated, I'm sorry, and we receive reward for what we do, we very often come to like what we do anyway. So, but we have our set of needs, right? Now we have our set of values. What are our values? Well, there are certain things I won't do. I was, I went to an interview and basically he ran a test, a group test, in which we had to put each other down, verbally. He stirred up a conversation and he wanted to see who rises up by putting the others down. I don't work in a place like that. I won't work in a place like that. It paid very well filled up all of my needs, yet contradicted one value of mine. I don't feel that I need to go up by stepping on somebody else. Yes? I agree. But what if, if you get out of that job, then you will die of hunger because you don't have money to live? Oh, very good question. Very good question. We are not going now into need. We're talking survival. then we're back to the value system. Does my need for money override my value system or not? That's also a value. 
at what things does my survive, do I allow my survival needs to override and what not? Am I allowed to steal in order not to starve? I don't know. It's a value. Nahon? So we're back to the value system. Who makes those rules? If two people are walking in the desert, I'm walking in the desert, he's walking in the desert, there's only one water container, only one of us can make us out alive, out of here alive. In order to survive, am I allowed to take his water container? If only one of us can get a job, am I allowed to lie about him in order to get the job? It's all values. Values versus needs. The question is, who makes them? Now, because our value systems come from different sources, we get confusion. You see, the, I don't know, gang member from South Central does not have decision-making problems, or very few of them because he has one value system and he tries to stay true to that. Okay? A Jewish Orthodox rabbi, knowing the Jewish value system, has very few decision-making dilemmas. He has difficulty executing it because they're very difficult values. But to know, to choose what's the right thing, not so difficult. Because he has a system and he's true to that. When do we start having problems making decisions? When we have mixed up sets of values. When we try to take this set of values and that set of values and this set of values and make a big salad out of it, that's when we get stuck. Okay? So our first piece of advice is, <coughs> if you're going to adapt a set of values, adapt one and adapt it in whole. You don't get to pick and choose. Because the moment you get to pick and choose, <coughs> we're back to the problem with the values, exactly. We're back to the instinct. Okay? The moment we have a full system that covers every possible situation, I'm set. Now, pick one system. <laughs> Very good. We don't pick and we don't choose. We use our logic. There is no value system in picking a value system. We only have tool of logic. God gave every healthy-minded human being a tool to be able to judge the most basic value systems. <coughs> yes? In the Torah, you don't have all the, not even in the religious life, you don't have all the decisions set up. <laughs> okay, question or statement? It's kind of a question, like, so there are a lot of, like, I don't know how to formulate the question, but you, I will help you. Give me your name. Miriam. Miriam. Let me help you formulate a question. <laughs> Paz, does the Torah have a solution for every single possible situation I might end up being in? I think no. <laughs> okay. Um, I also thought that no until I find out it does. The only thing is that we don't always have access to that information. Okay? I don't always know what it is. So I'll go to somebody who's more knowledgeful in, in the Torah and ask him. And if he doesn't know, he'll go to somebody higher. And if he doesn't know, he'll go to somebody higher. I don't want to end with a negative story, but it ended up as a good story, so I'll say it anyway. It went, it went like this. Um, Seven years ago, roughly, seven or eight years ago, I was faced with a dilemma, facing two different values. Mm -hmm. 
my wife had two weeks left before giving birth to what we found out was our daughter, our first daughter. Our firstborn was a boy. We already had a, he was almost a year old. She was about to give birth to the second one, was Sarah, a daughter. Right around that time, two days before that, my mother in the, oh, by the way, we lived in Israel. My mother in the United States had a stroke. She was lying in the hospital alone, because my brother also lived in Israel, and we're only two brothers, had a stroke, and um, she was mostly paralyzed in the hospital in the U.S., needing her oldest, which is me, to come and take over, help, yell at the doctors, scream at the nurses, make sure she's being treated right, take care of her, okay? Hospitals are a very dangerous place. In case you guys didn't know, hospitals in the United States kill approximately 120,000 people a year. That's the ones they kill, not the ones that actually die there. That's the ones that weren't supposed to die, okay? So hospitals are a very scary place. You should know that if Chas Shalom anybody dear to you is in a hospital, don't leave them there alone. So, I'm faced with a major dilemma. Do I leave my fresh bride of two years with a one-year-old baby two weeks before giving birth and go to help my mom? Or do I desert my mother of 29 years in a hospital mostly paralyzed and stay to take care of my wife and child now through that through your value system and tell me what does it give you oh there we go right I didn't say open a guessing game <laughs> Okay? I can see the guys in the back. I put $50 on mom. <laughs> Anybody wants to take bets? <laughs> yeah? Mom, wife, wife, mom. Show of hands. Mom. Wife. We are seriously have to do, gonna have to do the whole marriage thing all over again. <laughs> okay? Before any of you guys get married, we're gonna have to talk. Too young. Like <laughs> well, you have a brother. Your brother can go to your mother. Oh, there you go. My brother couldn't leave the country because of the army. Okay? So. Now, did you change your mind? Does your wife have a sister or something? <laughs> that, I could always marry my wife's sister, but no. No, no, no. I need to help her. Help her. <laughs> <laughs> After my wife divorced, actually by law, even if I divorce my wife, I cannot marry her sister. No, I didn't mean that. She didn't mean that. She didn't mean She does have a sister, but uh, as, as anyone will tell you, when your wife is about to give birth to your child, guess who's going to have to stand outside the delivery room? door or at least next door. It's going to be you. So, the dilem dilemma was so great, I didn't know what the Torah wants me to do. Right? God broke it down. There's, there isn't a question that's not in the Torah. So, I was clueless. I went to my rabbi. I said, Rabbi, help me out. I, I maxed out my knowledge. Nothing in there that can help me out. What can you do for me? He chewed it over a much couple of minutes. Said, no, we're taking this to the top floor. <laughs> and he sent me over to one of our Gdoleador. Okay? I went over there. And then I've got a very, very, very unique answer. 
said both are mitzvah. Both are a mitzvah, and not only are both a mitzvah, they're equivalent. You can do either or. Okay? So now it broke back down from being a choice between two different values to being a, a pick, because they're identical. Now I went back to the rabbi. I said, look, I'm not playing pick with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. Somebody's going to have to take responsibility for it, and it's not me. <laughs> okay? As I keep telling my wife, I became religious, so I don't have to make decisions anymore. Okay? There's a book. Let it make the decisions. So, I went back to the rabbi, and I said, look, the big rabbi said, I can do it either or. He said, then listen to this. See? Think outside the box. In two weeks, your wife will have two babies at home. There isn't any chance in the world she's going to let you go anywhere. Go now, come back in 10 days. And that's what I did. Got on an airplane the next day, flew to the US. Eight days later, I get a phone call. Congratulations, daddy. You have a daughter. So you were in the delivery room. No, I wasn't. But it wasn't my fault anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I got out of it free. Now, the great thing about it, and I said we're going to finish on a nice note, my wife actually thanked me for going. Why? Because in merit of that great sacrifice of hers as a wife, allowing me to go to my mother and yes it's a sacrifice on her and yes she has the priority okay not the mitzvah but the priority she has and without her consent without her agreeing i would not have gone okay if there is a mitzvah to go to your mother then it's a mitzvah but if they're equal my <coughs> rights are to my wife. And she said, go. Go to your mother. Go take care of her. I'll wait for you. She didn't. <laughs> Come back and, and she gave birth early. When our firstborn was to be born, from the time her water broke to the time that little screamer came out, was ready for this 27 hours okay during which we didn't sleep or really eat by the time he came out i collapsed when she went to give birth to our second child we think that it's thanks to the merit of her sending me to take care of my mom and her self-sacrifice she gave birth within, anybody was, would like to take a bet on that one? 20 minutes. <laughs> She's also a prophet. It was 20 minutes. She went to the hospital, she laid on the bed, and... Sorry. Ah, there you go. She laid on the bed, 20 minutes later... So I was out. Okay? So, there is a tip for easy birds for you ladies. <laughs> Send your husbands away. <laughs> and you should give birth quickly. Okay? <laughs> but this is what a value system is. We were my wife never had any hard feelings towards me or my mother. My mother never had hard feelings towards my wife. We all live in peace and harmony. Because we all adhere to the same value system. That can work as long as no, no one not an individual, one of us, is making up the value system. 
it can only work if the value system is of an external source. Now, your homework assignments are as follows. Go home. Yeah, go home. Okay. <laughs> Grab your computers, log out of Facebook, and type TED.com. TED.com. I'm sorry? Who said it's not already open? Yeah, Facebook addicts. Okay. <laughs> okay. In TED.com, type happiness under the search category. Select a lecture by, the name, by a speaker named Dilbert, family name Dilbert. Watch it. It's 21 minutes. It took me five times to just understand what he's saying because the information there is so condensed. It's so revolutionary. It's so out of the box, out of, yeah, that it took me a while to get it. Yeah, it was a really a humbling experience. Watch it. Watch it again. Watch it a few more times. Okay? Then, Write down, you know, just bullet points, the messages he's getting across, the results of his researches, his philosophies, ideas, conclusions, concepts, premises. Okay? Then take another piece of paper. Write down your opinions. What do you agree with? What don't you agree with? What would you like more information about? Okay? Our next meeting, oh by the way, tell your friends that are going to join us next week to also listen to it so they'll be in the same, on the same page with us. On the next meeting, we will see, first of all, how do we look at scientific research in a real light. How do we learn to process and filter information we get? Second thing, how do we use that information to help our decision-making process? Because the one thing that we didn't mention, and I was waiting for somebody to bring up, is the importance of decision-making. There is one thing that proper decision making does for us that's worth everything else. Anybody knows what it is? Makes us happy. Your happiness is dependent, if not solely, then almost solely, on how good your decision making process is. That's the conclusion from the story I told you about my wife and my mother and myself. And that is very evident from a Chazal saying with which we will end. Chazal say, everybody know who Chazal is? Our wise sages. Very bad translation of Chazal, okay? Chazal say, En simcha kehatarat asfekot. There is no joy as that of relieving of doubt. Once you're relieved from doubt, you can then experience the maximum amount of joy. From that we learn that the greatest agony is what? Doubt. doubt. You want to be happy creatures? You want to wipe these serious sad faces off of your faces and walk around with silly stupid smiles like I do? Adapt a good decision-making system. Okay? So next meeting, we're going to take a step closer towards being constantly stupidly happy. Looking forward to having you all. Questions I would love to get.